Christine is a distinguished Anderson alum who really, in a sense, didn't plan on coming to Anderson. You were a science major. Mm -hmm. At some point, you thought that you might go into STEM research, be a PhD. So I always like starting with uh, the connection of the dots about today, looking backwards, is how you think today in part related to your roots and along the way trace the transitions? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be back. And when I was at um, GSM, which is what it was called in the day, Jill Baldoff um, was in my class and she remembers we were in that really not very attractive <laughs> building um, over on Hillgard. So uh, you guys have a really nice place to go to school. Um, but thank you very much uh, for, for that question, Judy, because I sometimes refer to myself as the accidental MBA uh, because I never really planned or I didn't have a, um, a set path on how I was going to lead my life, run my career. Um, I really did graduate as, um, as someone from undergraduate school as someone who wanted to get a PhD in biology. Um, and the reason is, is because that's what I knew, that's what I liked, I had a passion for it. But also, um, I looked around in the world, there weren't a whole lot of women in business. Uh, there weren't a lot of uh, women role models. And I knew a lot more women who were in academia, and some were in the professions, and you know, I knew some women lawyers, and of course women doctors. I definitely did not want to be a uh, lawyer. I actually thought about going to medical school, but thought, you know, I actually didn't want to deal with people that much, and so. <laughs> Um, anyway, life changes and you change and you morph. Um, but my, the reason I came to business school was really, um, I had a kind of a life-changing event in my life. I was deferring PhD admissions. I l moved out to Los Angeles um, and I was you know, trying to figure out, did I want to go to school on the West Coast or go back to one of the East Coast colleges or universities that I was accepted to? And um, my father died suddenly. And it was pretty traumatic for me. And I had um, someone who I worked for say, you know, I think you should really think twice about going back and getting your PhD for simple economics. And they walked me through, and this is back in the late 70s, they walked me through what I would make <laughs> as you know, a something professor of, of uh, biology at some school someplace. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound that good. And um, I think those, that was their way of coercing me into uh, going to business school. But anyway, so that's how I wound up at, um, at uh, UCLA. It was like, OK, I'll go for it. I'll see if it, if, try it on and see if it fits. Um, I actually liked it quite a bit. Um, it was completely different than my undergraduate training. Um, I think I did take macro and microeconomics. And that's as close to business as I got. Um, I also tell people I did read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day, but um, never ever thought of uh, a career in business. And then take us through this move because very few people, let alone people who happen to be women, end up being the CFO of Disney, uh, one of the largest corporations in the world. So h how do you make those moves? Yeah. Um, once again, I don't think of myself as reckless. Actually, I can be pretty uh, focused and directed. Um, but I had opportunities that came up in my life that there was a little bit of risk taking. Um, first, after I graduated from UCLA, I went into banking. I started out in strategic planning um, at First Interstate. Um, and I was there for 15 years. And I had a great career there. 15 years, rose rapidly through the ranks. Um, I think I was the youngest ever EVP there, and I happened to be a woman, which was pretty unusual. I heard great accolades from a person who was your boss, who was my predecessor. The dean of UCLA Anderson was the president of First Interstate, where mm -hmm. you started, Bruce Willison, and he just raved about you. You started the same day as he did, I think, at First Interstate, he yeah, said. I think yeah. we did. We yeah. did. Um, and he, I, Bruce was a wonderful colleague, and I, I really enjoyed working with him. Um, but anyway, so I went to uh, First Interstate, and that, I probably would have, if it was still there, who knows, I may have stayed in banking my entire career, but it um, ceased to exist because we went through a hostile takeover with Wells Fargo uh, back in the mid-1990s. Um, that was one of those experiences that was gr great in retrospect. It was grueling in the middle of it. 
Um, but after First Interstate, I looked around and I had two little kids at the time um, and I really wanted to stay in Los Angeles. And I wound up going to um, Imperial Bank as a CFO. Um, I was there for about three years. That, ba that bank was also um, taken out in a merger uh, with Comerica, which is a Midwestern bank. And I kind of looked around and I thought, what am I going to do? I think I'm going to retire. I actually think I'm going to go back and get my PhD. And literally, this is how it happened. My sister was an investment banker in New York, and I was talking to her, and I said, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to, like, dust off these, uh, these PhD uh, files and, and really go for it. And she said, well, I just got an email that Disney's looking for a treasurer. Should I put your name in? And I said, sure, put it in. Maybe you shouldn't put it in because you're my sister, so her boss put it in. And, um, and that's literally, uh, so Tom Staggs, um, who was the CFO at the time, he called me. He said, do you want to come over and talk? And I said, sure. He said, you know, we're, in the, you know, we're pretty far down doing a search, but why don't you come over? And I drove out to uh, Burbank and met with him. We immediately clicked it off. And he said, can you come back tomorrow and meet with Michael Eisner? I said, sure. And 23 interviews later, um, <laughs> literally, um, I had an offer, and that's how I wound up at Disney. And, um, you know, people say, like, what was the transition going from banking into Disney? And it's a completely different industry, as we all know. Um, financial services is a great place to hone your finance skills. Um, you know, your business is money, and so if you like doing capital markets, you like doing planning, you like doing, I did investor relations there, but I had a very full array of uh, responsibilities in banking. And um, when I went to Disney, I could, those were all transportable because I went in as treasurer, I ran corporate finance, you know, uh, international issues like, um, you know, currency uh, hedging and interest rate risk management were all things that I had done. So I was able to take those into an industry and learn the entertainment industry. Um, so it's, it is a portable, uh, finance is a very portable skill and I don't think you have to, you know, commit to one single industry your entire life. Switching to your current role as CFO, you report directly to Bob Iger. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a direct line to the board. Mm -hmm. So talk about how you conceptualize your role for yourself as the CFO between the strategic role, the compliance role, how you relate to the board, how you relate to Bob, and to the strategic moves of the company. Sure. Um, I would say I am extraordinarily fortunate to work for someone like Bob Iger. I am the first CFO that's a female. Um, and, you know, for a high-profile company like Disney, um, you know, he, he took some risk in that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful working relationship. We have um, full transparency. Um, I consider myself um, eyes and ears on the finance side. Um, and also working with our businesses very closely. He works, you know, on a regular basis with all of our uh, business leaders, as do I, but we don't necessarily always hear the same things. So a lot of times we, um, we, we just collaborate on what's going on. We think, about, we think about where we are currently as a company, where we're going, where our challenges are, um, what are the issues we we're facing, you know, in the short term as well as long term, and try to have flexibility in what we do. Um, working with the board, we're also very fortunate to have an extraordinarily high quality board. Um, I, w um, I spend a lot of time with our audit committee. Um, all of the uh, people on our audit committee are extraordinarily uh, deep in finance as well. Um, so yeah, I look at them sometimes as being almost an advisor to me if there's an issue. Um, and I want to, you know, run something by them. You know, they're always available for that. Um, and but it's a, in in the full board is uh, someone as a group that every single board meeting I have to give them updates or make formal presentations. So um, it's a very um, complete and consistent and frequent dialogue with the board and the in the committees um, as well as um, with with Bob. Um, you know, and one, once again, I think one of the things I talk about a lot is chemistry. And I think when, you, especially where you are in your careers, and 
looking at where, you know, what next. Um, I always like to equate it a little bit like you know, dating. Like, is this someone you want to spend a lot of time with? Is this a team you want to spend a lot of time with? Is this a company that you feel in alignment with your values and their values? And I think all of those things are important. Um, and especially when you're um, at an executive level, you really have to have a rapport, not only with, with your direct boss, mine being Bob Iger, but also with um, our entire executive management team. I mean, you've got huge financial responsibilities in a conglomerate that is flung all over the world. And so huge financial responsibilities, but at the same time you play a major strategic role. H how do you uh, navigate that? Is it tension or those two slightly different lens through which you see the business? Yeah, I mean, there's, once again, when you're a publicly traded company, there's an awful lot of pressure for quarterly earnings. And short-termism um, is a term that um, fellow CFOs that I know use. And it can kind of drive you crazy. Because if you're looking at what is the real purpose of a company to create long-term shareholder value, there's a lot of different constituencies that feed into that. but. Sometimes you have to look at your business, you know, not just through the next 90 days, you know, what are your next quarterly results going to be, but where are you going to be making investments? Where are you going to be driving your business? And, and some, you know, there is a cost to investing, um, and not all your investments are going to work out perfectly. Um, we've had some that have worked out extraordinarily well, and we've had some that didn't work out quite as well. Now, the good thing is, is the big ones all really worked out well. And, um, some of the acquisitions that we've done since Bob has been CEO since 2005, you know, have been investments that we got a lot of grief, quite honestly, from the street when we did them. That you know, people questioned, you know, that perhaps you, we paid too much for Pixar. If you look at what Pixar's done as part of the Disney family, we didn't pay too much for Pixar. The same thing can be said of Marvel as well as Lucas. And so those are three things that um, if we were just saying, oh, you know, look, looking at the accretion dilution models and, oh, we, 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 can't, we can't do this because, you know, it's an investment. And there's always risk to investments. Um, but once again, the strategy behind all of those acquisitions was really sound, and we believe it was part of our overall strategy. Uh, that we made the commitment to do them and, and also focused a lot on how we were going to manage them once they were inside of the company. So speaking of these acquisitions and big moves that you've made, what's the process at Disney? Obviously there's a discipline, but is it that you identify a gap and you say, I'm going to go after this niche in order to bridge that gap, or is it that some opportunity presents itself and that you seize those opportunities or both? How, how does it work? And especially in the fast changing digital world that we're living in that's changing everything about the experience for consumers. Great questions. Um, the, the one example I'll use of, of something that we felt was a necessity was uh, the acquisition of Pixar. And the reason that was a necessity is when you go back to the legacy roots of the Walt Disney Company, started by Walt, um, it was animation. And uh, Disney animation had kind of lost its way. And they were not, you know, the movies we were putting out uh, prior to the uh, Pixar acquisition for about a 10 year period. You know, it's, it wasn't that they didn't look good, it's that they, they weren't great stories. Um, some, uh, you know, they, you know, they, they just didn't resonate. They didn't, they didn't compel um, people to go see them. And the Disney brand, we felt, was suffering under that. And Pixar, we knew, had a great process. Um, at that point, all the movies that they had uh, produced and released, we were releasing them for them. Um, but we, um, they were all successful. And they were doing something that we weren't doing, which was, once again, great storytelling, stories that had, had heart. Um, you know, they, they tugged at your, your you know, emotions. And there were also stories that weren't just um, targeted towards kids. I mean, they were really what we call four quadrant movies, which is going across, you know, the full spectrum of, of family entertainment. 
And um, so when we acquired Pixar, it was also to bring that talent into the Walt Disney Company and to, and to let that team, that executive management team of John Lasseter, which is a name um, if you follow uh, Disney or, or you know, what's going on in the animation world, um, you know, John Lasseter is known as a creative genius, and he, he and his partner Ed Catmull, who is kind of the technology wizard behind Pixar, they were able to completely change the way Disney animation um, operates and the kind of movies that uh, they created and produced. And, and when you look at a little movie by the name of Frozen, I think you would, you know, realize that, wow, that really works. Uh, another movie Disney Animation did that just won the Oscar this past um, February was Zootopia. Um, once again, you watch those movies, they, they look great, they feel good, and they're really, really good stories. So that's, that's something that really saw a need and you know, we went for it. When you look at the world that we live in today, which is, you know, we've got a parks business, a global parks business that's you know pretty impressive. Domestically, we've got parks in Orlando and in Anaheim. Anaheim was the original. Um, internationally, we have um, we have a, an, a licensing arrangement with uh, Tokyo Disneyland. It's owned by Oriental Land Company, but that's all of our IP and and managed. Um, the same way as we manage our other parks. There's Euro Disney, and we have Hong Kong Disneyland, and uh, most recently we opened up Shanghai Disneyland, which is a big deal in China, doing extremely well, and we couldn't be happier with the way that that park has started off. So that's our parks business. We also have consumer products and studio, and I put those two together all the time because our studio, a lot of our studio releases drive consumer products. So. When we have, um, in the next quarter, we have um, a movie by the name of Cars. It'll be the third installment of Cars. Cars is what we call an evergreen franchise for consumer products. And that is gonna be a driver for our consumer products in the second half of our fiscal year. Um, so once again, the studio products tends to really have an uplift on, uh, the studio releases can have an uplift on our consumer products business. Our studio, um, is a little bit different than other studios in that we release far fewer films than most major studios. Uh, this year we only have seven releases, next year we'll have 12, but they're all high quality branded intellectual property franchises. So you have Marvel, you have the Pixar films, Disney Animation, and another acquisition which has really worked out well so far and we're really looking forward to each subsequent um, release is Star Wars from Lucasfilm. So those are, those are the kind of movies that we're doing. And if you look at Disney live action, it's really using um, Disney franchise characters. Best example of the one that's out there in the marketplace now is Beauty and the Beast. And that's another over billion dollar um, box office movie that we have. And the studio continues to you know, set record, industry records um, on a year over year basis. Um, so then we have the media business, and if there's one part of our business that's being disrupted, it is media, and it's because a couple of things. One is technology is allowing consumers to consume differently, and you have just the, the consumer preferences are changing. So what they want to consume and how they want to consume it, the convergence of the technology being an enabler and consumer preferences changing is really disrupting traditional media. It's really being adapting and trying to figure out how, how, do, you, how do you play in this new environment. So an example of investments that fall into that category is something we did um, a little while back. It was we made an investment in something called BAM Tech, and that's Baseball Advanced Media Technology. And um, we made an investment. We have um, about a 30% ownership. We have a path to control over a period of time. But that's a world-class video streaming platform. And, and we're going we're gonna to work with them. Uh, before the end of this year, there'll be an ESPN branded um, over-the-top package that they'll put out. And we'll see what kind of adoption there is and how customers and consumers, sports fans, um, 
consume that. So you have to try a lot of different things and some will work better than others. And, and how media companies play it, you'll see continued investments in technologies and distributions. Um, and you'll see something as dramatic as you know, AT&T and Time Warner. That was a big merger. But I think on the other hand, you'll see a lot of other, um, I wouldn't call them experiments, but I'd say a lot of other initiatives being tried by other media companies. One of the things that I think is very challenging for a company with the traditions and the scale, the global scale of, of Disney, is to take risks, to take big bets. I mean, when you were talking, for example, about the movie properties, a lot of them are franchises, as you call them, evergreen franchises, very sure bets, huge dollars invested. But I've heard Bob Iger talk about the fact that your incumbents, your huge incumbents, and the price of entry for insurgents is very low to come and disrupt. How do you create that sense of insurgency inside such a big, established, traditional company? Um, I would say that we view insurgency or disruption right now as a necessity. Um, we go through, like a lot of companies, we go through a planning process every year, both you know the short-term things for your annual plans, but also longer term. And, and the point of our longer term focus is really looking at disruption um, and not necessarily looking at how do you keep doing what you're doing, but you know, how do you take the, the trends, how do you take global influences, how do you ch take changing taste patterns, consumption patterns, and bring that thinking in and really critically look at your your businesses and say, you know, do we, do, are we just milking, you know, this big old fat cow or are we going to be looking at, you know, how, how do we get the next, you know, flock to grow here and there? So there's a lot of risk taking that you have to incorporate into your thinking and then you just have to get down to making very good calculated risks. But do you tolerate failure? I think if you succeed at everything you do, you're probably not trying hard enough. Um, I think, um, you know, failure is one of those things, it's like no one wants to fail, but, you know, failing at something little is better than failing at something big. <laughs> um, but also, you learn a lot through failures. And, um, and if you're a large company, um, you, there will be things that just don't work out like you thought they would. Without um, killing and then, the messenger. Mm -hmm. Without killing the messenger. Yeah, without killing the messenger. And I, but, I, you know, but you can't make the same mistake over and over. So once again, you gotta learn from your failures, learn you know, the, the Monday morning lessons learned, um, and say, well, why didn't something work out quite the way we thought it would? I'll ask a couple of questions for, for in deference to my finance colleagues here as a CFO. Um, what, one of the big issues that you have to deal with in this global company that you run is, um, fluctuations in currency mm -hmm. rates and exchange rates that could very much what do you have an in, investor call in two weeks a lot of times the issues are not so much about how much revenue you've done but how the currencies of different mm -hmm. markets are are, are are faring at that moment so how do you, how do you deal with that we're probably a textbook case in, in at least the banks all tell us this that we're probably um, one of the best in class when it comes to managing our currency risk. And the same thing would apply to interest rate risk. Um, we have a very um, process oriented, but very, we, we finely tune it and we are always tweaking. We just don't set it and forget it. We're always going back in and saying, you know, how can we do things a little bit differently? But we have a four year time horizon for managing currency risk. And we lapsed, so for the current year, we're 100% hedged. We were 100% hedged before we start our fiscal year. So we know if our businesses come in on plan, we should, we should not have a fluctuation. If you're investing in a company like Disney, the last thing you want is us either taking uh, bets on currency or having a lot of volatility that's unmanaged because we have other businesses that can you know, have, um, you know, peaks and valleys. So you buy Disney based on, on us managing our business as well, not for you know, having you know, one-time gains um, or losses in currency. If we're looking at the world these days, some might say there's some uncertainty about policy changes that might occur 
in the US. Uh, for example, we're thinking about deregulatory impacts or tax impacts for corporate entities and for individuals. Mm -hmm. So how does Disney navigate through some of this, how should one call it, uncertainty about what's going to be? Well, there's what we know and what we don't know. Um, and we do live in pretty interesting times. Um, I think we, we all know that um, the markets have reacted extremely bullish um, since the election. Um, there, there was a lot of, and still is, expectations of uh, tax reform. I think the market's mostly focused on the corporate side of tax reform, but I think you'll have some uh, personal component of that um, if and when it gets done. Um, but you know, we we look at those influences, and you know, we're not making plans based on them, but we understand the impacts on us. Now, as as it relates to corporate tax reform, um, that would be a big benefit to us because uh, we are a fairly full taxpayer just because of the nature of our businesses. We're U.S. dollar functional. We have you know our businesses. Um, we distribute a lot of product globally that's uh, domiciled here in the US. So our corporate tax rate is in the mid 30s. Uh, so when you hear about these nice cuts down to, you know, down to the, into the 20s or as low as 20, um, you can just do the simple math and that's a big benefit uh, to a company like ours. But we believe more importantly that corporate tax reform is necessary for US companies, especially global US companies to be really competitive um, on the you know, world, the world, you know, landscape. Um, we, you know, this, everyone knows that, you know, our tax regime here in the, in the States puts U.S. companies at a competitive disadvantage when you look at the global marketplace. I'll um, end with a couple of questions on, on Disney's uh, corporate citizenship programs, which are under your mm -hmm. bailiwick, and they're so extensive and so uh, diverse. In, in their reach and impact. So, so give us the big picture of what are the big goals you'd like to impact through Disney's CSR program and how do you track the most important facets of it? So we, we call it citizenship, but it's just another name for corporate social responsibility. Um, we manage that at an enterprise level and then we have all of our businesses that may have discrete programs that are important to their businesses. Uh, a good example is, you know, we've got um, some uh, local TV stations. There's one here in Los Angeles. Um, they, they may do things that are specific to their marketplace. Um, in our parks, they may be doing something specific in Anaheim, down in, in, uh, at Disneyland, or in Orlando. Uh, where Walt Disney World is based. But we have overarching um, kind of principles and, you know, not to be trite about it, but it's really, you know, doing, you know, doing things that we believe are good for, you know, children and families. That's one of our big focuses. We also have, um, and we've got some programs, I'll, I'll just rattle some of them off to you, but, but doing, you know, things that are, are meaningful and can really help people. Um, we also believe in environmental stewardship, so we we started. You know, we've had some initiatives that uh, were we were one of the first companies to start a carbon offset uh, program and things like that. We have the Disney Conservation Fund um, that also um, is very focused on um, not only educating children about conservation and and you know keeping the world the, the world our planet a healthier place but also working on endangered species um, so you know those are kind of some of the things another one that we we have in, and we talk a lot about it is um, a program for hiring veterans not only hiring veterans but also um, working with veteran companies so we started something called heroes work here and when it was first announced, we wanted to have, it was announced, I think, in 2012, we wanted to hire 1,000 veterans in the first three years. Well, we hired over 1,000 in the first year. And to date, we've hired over 8,000. So that's been extraordinary, extraordinarily successful. And we also train other companies on how to do this. 
Um, so we look at those things as giving back, making the world a better place, and where we can um, have impact. But there's just a couple of things I want to talk about because this is when you see the power of the brand. So I mentioned Lucas, you know, uh, Star Wars. They have a program called Star Wars Force for Change, and that's something that they use not just with um, with our, you know, the, the actors and the talent, but it's also with their fans. Um, I know there's, there may be some here, uh, very loyal Star Wars fans, and they go to conventions, and they dress up, and, you know, they, they actually come up with ideas, and, and it's a pretty powerful program, and um, they've raised, just since that started, which was last year, $13 million for UNICEF and the Starlight Foundation. Um, and we also just last week announced um, at a Star Wars uh, convention down in Orlando a new virtual reality program. They're headsets that um, kids can wear when they're in the hospital. And that can transform a hospital mm. stay, which can be pretty mm. miserable, into something that's you know enjoyable, or the moments when they're mm. when they're doing something other than you know getting poked and prodded. That's that's something that it, once again, we we view the things that we have. You know, how can we bring a little joy to people's lives? Marvel has a program called Hero Acts, and that's with both talent and uh, and also um, you know in, a lot of that's done on social media. Um, people can take photos, upload them, um, and they're, if you have um, a hero-inspired photo, we'll make a contribution to save our children. Uh, we also have a big hospital program, um, and over the years, we've donated uh, quite a, millions and millions to hospitals, but this was something that was started back from Walt himself. I mean, he felt very strongly about you know, making, making the experience that if a child has to be hospitalized, make it a little bit better. Um, so we provide annual product packages to over 400 hospitals um, across the country. We also loan our talent to do um, hospital visits. We, um, we also have some of our Imagineers who design uh, either playrooms or lobby spaces, once again, to make them a little brighter and a little cheerier. Uh, we have a Disney Wish program, and a lot of times this is working with uh, the foundations that grant children's wishes. But as you can imagine, a lot of kids, you know, they have one wish, and some, some of these are terminally ill children, but sometimes their wishes are to go to a theme park or to be visited or, you know, be with a, a character that they love. And we um, last year celebrated our 100,000th wish through Make-A-Wish Foundation. So once again, those are the things that you know yeah. we, we continually push out there. Yeah, I, I've also seen the environmental goals that you have because the parks create a lot of energy and a lot of waste mm -hmm. and, and how you're um, disposing of that, of that waste. You know, this is a more intangible um, ramification of, of, of Disney's social responsibility and that is that in a sense you're in this vaulted status of molding the hearts and minds of generations that grow up. You, you, have, uh, uh, you can beeline right into the way these kids and their parents think. So how do you take that responsibility of being a, such an influencer of younger generations and what, given that role, will you not do um, to protect those values that are so aligned with your brand? So, you know, when we think about, you know, we're at the core of Disney, we're a content company. Um, we create content, you know, it's uh, highly branded family entertainment on a global basis. A, a lot of, when you come right down to the essence, the core of that, it's storytelling, and it's storytelling with the heart, as well as common themes. And some of the themes, and I think, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have seen Disney movies. And when you think about some of the themes, you know, just think about a movie when I rattle these off. Um, but it's optimism. So our, we try to be positive. Our stories try to be positive. Um, also, um, being true to yourself is, is, and to your beliefs is something we try to integrate into our storytelling. 
Uh, perseverance in the face of adversity is another theme that runs through a lot of our movies. Um, the importance of family and friends. Um, I think if you think about, especially a lot of our animated movies, they really tug at your heartstrings because it's about families, it's about friends. It can be something like Toy Story, where the friends are the toys. And, you know, but, you know, you can't, some of those movies you can't leave without, you know, having a good cry for yourself and bring in some Kleenex. But, <laughs> but those are things, family and friends are, are something that's really important, we believe, to happy people. Um, and also, um, especially when you look at whether it's Marvel movies or Star Wars movies, there's a lot of triumph over good and evil. Basic theme, you can tell a lot of stories around that. And also, um, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that can be everything from animated movies through to the Marvel and the Lucas brands. And I think inclusivity, you show, I mean, look at Star Wars, every type of person, every walk of life, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, questions. Hi, I'm Sipra. I actually just started my own consulting firm. I used to do digital marketing. So I'm pretty curious on you touching upon disruption within the workplace and especially within media. What are your thoughts, and I'm biased obviously, but about bringing in outside help and consultants and transitioning through this change? We, we use consultants all the time. Um, we, it depends on what the issues are. Um, we like to have very targeted, focused projects uh, with deliverables with consultants. Um, but disruption is, once again, something that we wouldn't outsource it. We would, um, we can, we work with consultants on that, but it's not something that we would, you know, I, I think for a company that really has, you know, an internal kind of gyroscope, um, when you get down to the essence of, you know, strategy, it has to be driven from within. That doesn't mean that you won't bring in resources to help figure out specific problems, but setting a strategy is something I think that has to come out of the CEO and the senior management team. I'm Jay Tucker. I run the Center for Media, Entertainment, and Sports here. Um, you mentioned ESPN and some of the new things that you've got in the works, right, MLBAM and so on. It made me think about the fact that what we're seeing over the last couple of years is this idea that there's lots of money to be made by taking uh, content, whether it's sports, scripted, et cetera, but finding the audience that loves it and kind of creating these exclusive windows for that audience that really loves it to really you know, kind of pay for that experience. Now, on the one hand, it seems like that's a great opportunity to increase revenue. On the other hand, potentially you're fragmenting your audience um, and particularly with some of the values you talked about with respect to Disney, those are universal values and Disney reaches a wide array of folks. Can you just talk from a CFO perspective about how you look at some of those platforms mm -hmm. and think about the kind of opportunities and challenges with respect to fragmentation? Sure. So, you know, you look at what's going on in the media industry and we, we know that it is being disruptive, will change, but when you look at the, what we call the ecosystem, the ecosystem that currently exists, it's, there's still a lot of people who have cable. There's still a lot of people who um, subscribe, we call them subs, um, subscribers. And if you were to start fragmenting it, you know, for Disney, we believe we have really strong brands. So depend, you know, if the, if the traditional cable universe, you know, just went poof overnight, um, we think we have the kind of brands that that will resonate and we will find the consumer. The consumer will find us. Um, there's a lot of disruption that goes into that. But when you look at some of the other content out there, it's not as compelling. So once again, we think we have the strongest hand to play and w just from a content perspective, whether it's you know the sports content we have on ESPN, the children's programming on the Disney Channel, um, you know, our movie product, which is, it lives in, in small screens as well as large screens. Um, but, you know, we look at that as it's going to be a transition. I have a question for you on um, the comment you made about uh, being hired as the, I think, first female CFO and how you felt, um, I think you said Bob Iger was kind of taking a risk. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on that and then also explain how you feel like maybe he became more comfortable with you being in the role or, or how you became more comfortable with yourself being in the role? You know, I had been a CFO before, Thank so, you. Um, you know, I kind of knew what I was, you know, getting into. Um, you know, being a CFO of a publicly traded company is, you know, it's a 
it, there's a lot of responsibility. Um, the as a big of a big big publicly yeah, traded company. Big big publicly traded company. Um, and we are held to, I believe we, and you work for Disney, I think, I think we're held to a higher standard than a lot of other companies. Um, just because of our brand, because people feel like they, they know Disney, they, they love Disney. Um, they, I mean, some of our shareholder meetings, most companies have a shareholder meeting and they're lucky if 20 people show up. We have a shareholder meeting and we have to hold it in, and we move it around the country too, because it's almost like the circus is coming to town. I mean, people show up, they're very excited. You know, we have characters out in the lobbies before people file in, you know, people, it's, it, they're, they're real events, but you know, people feel like they know Disney. So once again, this high profile nature um, is something that it kind of permeates everything we do. I think um, our executives are held to a high standard. Um, if things don't work out, um, we tend to get probably a disproportionate amount of, of press than, than other companies would. But, you know, I look, you know, I've been fortunate to, you know, be at the company for a little over 17 years and, and, you know, I've known Bob the entire time. Um, the, you know, the, the risk is that anytime you put someone into a new job, it's, you know, it's always a risk. You just never know. And as someone, you know, referred to, and it wasn't me per se, but they were talking about, you know, people in roles and they said, you know, sometimes you put someone, they may be, you know, a, a great second chair of violin, but you put them in the first chair, you, they may not, it may, it doesn't necessarily translate. What made you successful in your old job doesn't necessarily make you successful in your new job. And that, that involves, you know, a different set of responsibilities, but it also involves how you interact with people. And in making that transition, some are more successful than others. So once again, I think if, if I was Christopher and not Christine, um, it just wouldn't be, it, you know, I, I wouldn't have gotten the press I did. And once again, anytime you get a lot of publicity, it's like, you better perform. It's, um, I remember talking to um, the women inside Disney and it was like, wow, I gotta tell you, the last thing I'm gonna do is let anybody down. And I really feel that not only let the company down, let Bob down, but I also feel, you know, an obligation to, you know, really do well, you know, because, you know, women can do these jobs and, but there just aren't enough of them. So I think that that's really what I was referring to. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Disney Accelerator program and the prior Techstars program and, mm -hmm. and similar things like that that Disney is involved in. Sure. So we have something that's called the Thank Accelerator. You. And they get a bunch of applications. I think the number is like a couple thousand. Um, and we select probably 20 companies. And these are startup companies. And they can be everything from like first round to kind of mezzanine financed companies. Um, the full spectrum, um, they're from all over the country. Actually, there's some from overseas. And they come in and they work with Disney executives and they all basically bunker together in this one building over in Glendale. It's not a very glamorous building. Um, they're on card tables, but you know, it's kind of the pack mentality. And they're working on their business plans and it's an opportunity for us to see a bunch of new technologies. It's also an opportunity for them to um, get a diff bunch of different perspectives. So all of Bob's direct reports, as well as some other people, meet with them. And we'll literally meet with every single one of them. And it takes a couple of days to go through them, but you meet with every single team. And like when I meet with them, you know, I'll ask them a lot about their business plans. Um, I'll ask them about their financings. I'll ask them, you know, probably some, and some of them are more financially, some of them are pretty naive when it comes to finances. Um, but they, they tend to be really technology centric and we make a decision, you know, when we're going through this process, whether we want to make little investments in some of these companies. But once again, it's a two way street. They get to work with us. We get to see them. And, uh, there was something called, um, for Star Wars, the BB-8, you know, that little guy that, you know, ran around. Um, but the company that did, did that, um, Sphero, sure. we made an investment in Sphero. And, um, and once again, we have a licensing arrangement with them. When you were talking about the way um, disruptions were driving investments, maybe that you'd have to acquire something very large versus kind of growing it internally, I was wondering if you thought that was having an impact on the way you thought about capital structure, both debt mm -hmm. versus equity and kind of cash balances. Yeah. That's Thank a great you. question. Capital allocation is something that um, it's also part of our overall planning process. Um, 
we have a very uh, deliberate approach, which is first and foremost, we, we generate, you know, we have businesses that are highly profitable. We, we generate a lot of free cash flow. Um, we have about 20 billion of debt, and it's just because, you know, there's, that's part of our capital structure. But when we look at what we do with our capital allocation, first and foremost, we want to invest in our businesses that we believe have um, good prospects at you know, high returns. Um, those can either be extensions of business, invest in existing businesses or new initiatives. We also look at acquisitions. Um, that's part of our growth strategy. It doesn't mean we do one every year, um, but it's, it's part of our overall strategy and they can be, you know, small ones and big ones and investments or wholly owned. You, know, you buy something in 100% or you just make a small investment like we did in uh, BAM Tech. Um, and then we look at return of capital to shareholders. And as a publicly traded company, that's important to almost all your institutional investors. What are you going to do with this money? They don't want you hoarding cash on the balance sheet. So we do two things, like everyone does. Um, we, I shouldn't say everyone does, but we do. Um, we uh, pay a dividend. And our dividend, you're not going to buy Disney for the dividend, because our dividend is just a little over 1%. Um, but we, we've, we're a steady dividend payer. We increase it. We have had a history of increasing it regularly. Um, and the other thing is buying back stock. And we also do that and still have a very strong balance sheet. We look at our balance sheet as being a real competitive advantage. Last very quick question. Very quick. Um, we have quite a number of uh, about to be graduated MBAs here. Uh, if you were sitting there, knowing what you know, what advice would you give? So, um, don't approach your first job as your last job. Take some risk, but be very, um, um, What's a, uh, you want to take some risk, you don't want to be reckless, but you do want to push yourself. So do something that really appeals to you. Definitely do something that you have a passion for. And if there's one thing I would advise all of you to do is develop an expertise. Because if there's something that you are known as being an expert in, then you can always go back, fall back on that. But I think an expertise, just don't be a jack of all trades, master and none. Really, and it, it doesn't mean that you have to do that your entire career, but always make sure there's something that you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm damn good at this. Well, thank you for making us so proud of you, Christine. <laughs>